show alan before we begin to the actual interview why don't you introduce yourself to the fans like what what exactly you did in star wars and uh what you do now in star wars i was uh, i appeared in empire strikes back as a stormtrooper principally involved with the uh, carbon chamber working alongside the actors it took several weeks to shoot that therefore they needed people who could obviously take direction and work alongside actors, understanding, lighting, etc. But in the uh, uh, downtimes between um, relights and rejigging the scenes, I also daylighted going off onto other sets, working as a Hoth rebel, as a snow trooper. You name it, we did it. And then after that, I came in on uh, Return of the Jedi, onto the uh, Executor Bridge, working with Ken Coley. I got to deliver lines to him during the final battle to tell him that uh, we'd lost our bridge deflector shields and boom, we all blew up and destroyed the Death Star. Okay, so I guess the first thing we'll ask is, um, you know, you got to work on Empire Strikes Back with the late Irvin Kirshner. Yeah. What was it like working with, with, with the directors like Irvin Kirshner and then Mark Wad and then, you know, George Lucas himself, you know, being on the set, technically being in charge of, of both films? Well, uh, Irvin Kirshner was very nice. Really very, very nice. He knew exactly what he wanted at all times. Uh, he took great pains to explain shots to us. Um, he never spoke down to any of us because he understood that uh, in order to attain the scenes that he wanted, we were all in integral to it. So it didn't matter if, uh, if it was Harrison Ford he was talking to or it's to me or any of the other stormtroopers. He explained it in great detail and uh, made sure that he got the reactions he wanted. For that, we were very grateful because it was a very uncomfortable set to work on especially dressed in armor. It was extremely hot uh, and a dangerous set at that. George Lucas had very little to do with us on that particular shoot at all. Even when we got to do Return of the Jedi, Markham was fine. He was very, very friendly. George Lucas, once again, whispered in AD's ears, who passed on messages. You never actually heard from him what he liked and what he didn't like. You just had to keep on going until finally you, you hit the right note with him. But I was lucky on Return of the Jedi. I, I went in there and I, I was out within an hour having delivered that line, which I think was the shortest for anybody. I think the director was pretty hacked off. <laughs> the way things had gone during the morning, by the time I stepped in, I think it was a question of getting his blood pressure down, just getting the scene done, which I did. So I didn't have You got it done in an hour, which is... Yeah, I didn't have a great deal to do with him, to be honest with you. I made an absolute idiot of myself by stomping around the, the set, as I've said before in interviews, um, outside of the actual set built on the stage. I was stomping around the stage, screaming the line at the top of my voice, because he wanted complete reassurance that I could deliver the line, and repeatedly, if necessary, without making mistakes. So I did, at the top of my voice, shouting, and uh, the salmon... Recording and recording and recording and until finally they said, yeah, that's fine. And I came on the set and did it. It will be strange, a bit surreal, but there you go. But it's a line that everyone knows because it's just before, you know, the, the Super Star Destroyer explodes and crashes into the Death Star. So it's a, it's a memorable line. Exactly. Don't ever let me near a ship, especially if there's a Death Star. <laughs> well, if you're the rebels, of course, we're going to want you near the ship. It'll help us. <laughs> Do you have any, any stories of anything that happened on set that perhaps we, any behind the scenes stuff that we don't know about from what we see? Because, you know, what we see, of course, is a, you know, a very classic scene, but since it took so long, I'm assuming there's some things, you know, some classic mistakes or some things that just went wrong that you could probably tell us about? Well, there were few and far between, to be honest, because it was also very well choreographed. But on the other hand, there exists a photograph of one take which does actually appear in the film, but I think in the recuts they've managed to sort of cut round it, where one of the special effects guys left um, a wrench on the floor during a shot, as well as two fire extinguishers in the back of a shot, which wasn't very helpful. So they do actually appear in the film, and amongst the photos that um, I have up on my web page, You'll find that particular shot. You, you can't miss it because there are two fire extinguishers right in the middle of the shot. <laughs> um, sandwiched between me and uh, Darth Vader and Boba Fett on one side. The other thing which I have spoken about before on that particular set was the fact that it was a sort of very jury-built construction. It was, a, it was on a, a high rig, 
a rostrum on a high rig, which was all scaffolding, metal scaffolding. And it had one staircase, built staircase, which was to be used in the shots. Um, but unfortunately, because uh, the actual level of the, uh, the scaffolding was about 18 feet, um, it meant that access to that scaffolding rostrum should have been through those stairs. But because we had cameras and lighting and all the rest going on all the time, they took up all the room. So unfortunately for us, we ended up going up and down ladders, step ladders, which was pretty dangerous because we couldn't go up carrying our armor. We had to put it all on, including the helmets, and just to do the best we could. The one thing I've spoken about before happening on that particular set was that up 18 feet high, uh, as the camera was moved around on this circular rostrum set, um, it meant that everybody had to keep on being moved in relation to the camera lens so that we didn't block one another or block the artists. So we were always getting instructions from the camera saying, take one step to the left, one step to the right, whatever. And at one point, one guy did take one step too far to the right and ended up falling 18 feet onto his back, dressed in stormtrooper outfit, which shattered around him. Luckily, um, he wasn't badly hurt, but um, in those days we didn't have health and safety. so. You never knew quite what you were going to face. So did the armor protect him? No. Well, in a way, I suppose it did. I mean, he wasn't that badly <laughs> hurt, but it did shatter into a thousand pieces. It was very, very brittle, unlike the stuff they use today. So how did they uh, find you for the job? Like, how did you get chosen by Empire Strikes Back? I had not seen Star Wars. I had not seen A New Hope. Uh, oh, wow. No, I knew very little about it. I was solidly working, doing extra work, doing walk-on work, occasionally taking small parts. I was doing theatre work. Towards the end, I was also working in opera and in theatre and ballet, even. Not as a dancer, I hasten to add. Um, but I was, I was involved in lots of different parts of the, the industry. I was a singer as well on stage. So I wasn't that au fait with Star Wars, even when it came to doing The Empire Strikes Back. I turned up. There was no audition. I was just sent by my agent, along with a load of guys. And the criteria that meant you got the job or not was whether you fitted the outfit. Because wearing an, uh, wearing a... A helmet. It was uh, completely unimportant whether you could deliver lines because you had no lines to deliver anyway. You literally just took um, direction and did what one was told. So I managed to get myself into the armor. It was extremely tight on me because I was a very big guy. I still am, as you can see. I fill the screen. But yes, I I, uh, I managed to get into the armor, and so I got got the gig, as it were. And I didn't realize at that time how long it was going to go on for. I think the agent said it was two or three days, and it ended up as weeks. I'm assuming as soon as you, you got on board, they had you uh, sign this, the, the non-disclosure thing, that, where they say, you know, you learned how secret it was. So what was it like working on I said that was supposed to be very, very top secret, very, very, you know, they were doing lots of misdirection with it because people wanted to know what was going on. What was it like working on a set that was that secret or that uh, well, high key? There were other films that treated their, their shoots like that, specifically the Bond films. But uh, it was pretty new to be treated that way. I think I, I respected everything they wanted. I mean, if I was given uh, any dialogue, sheets of dialogue or, or whatever, call sheets, I surrendered them back. And when I was asked, I know that other people kept theirs or even photocopied theirs. No, I gave everything back. I was a good boy. Well, that's a good thing. So being working on Star Wars, that means you get to work a lot with fans because no matter who you are, if you've been on in Star Wars, the fans know you and know you forever, even if you you know never said a thing. So what's it like working with fans, going to conventions and being known for working on Star Wars? Do you have any interesting stories with, with fans, are either good or bad or well, I, 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 I love I absolutely love meeting with fans. Uh, they always know a great deal more about me than I can remember myself because um, since Return of the Jedi, I've not been acting in front of the camera. I have done acting still, but I, I no longer act as a, um, a screen actor. I went over to the other side, as it were, <laughs> to the dark side and uh, went into costume design. That's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. So a lot of the real, real fans, they know a lot about my work, um, specifically since then. I mean, they all come up and quote that line to me, and uh, they all do it with a, a face like a rabbit in the headlamps, which is how I was described as having, having um, delivered the line. So what made you want to go from you know, acting on stage or on a film to the costume and wardrobe? Like, what was the thing that switched in your mind that changed that, discovered your passion, I should say? Well, uh, I had worked um, on a few films helping out people prior to stepping back uh, and away from acting. 
and I enjoyed it. I hated working in theatre. I absolutely detested working at the Royal National Theatre because there I stepped in to do a little bit of uh, sempster work, sewing work, to help them out. And the guy who was the chief pattern cutter had a complete physical breakdown within two weeks of me joining. And so I was immediately rushed into his position because he was cutting for um, five different theatres in repertory. So for 27 shows in total, I took over all the cutting and I absolutely detested that. <laughs> but I've been trained in tailoring. Uh, my father was trained in tailoring. Uh, my mother was uh, also a maîtresse de salon for um, one of the Paris fashion houses. So I was brought up knowing how to sew. My parents made sure that I was shown all the, the right techniques for hand finishing, buttonholing and all the rest of it. So I had all of that. I just didn't particularly want to use it. And I got to the stage in my acting career where I was never going to be a star. Um, I could get on camera, deliver lines, do it fine, and uh, not end up on the cutting room floor. I could get up on a stage, I could do a two and a half hour set of songs, or even appear in, um, in a classical uh, oratorio or whatever as a soloist, but I wasn't heading anywhere. It was just uh, marking time. So I decided to have a change of career. And so that's why I decided to move uh, across. I never regretted it. So you've done designs for a lot of uh, big directors. Kenneth Branagh is someone that you know we've talked about a lot recently because you know when he's get, he got given a Marvel film, which was basically his dream film. And so if you you know had an opportunity since you worked on Star Wars before, if George yeah. Lucas said he wanted to make a live action series and said you want to come make some of the costumes, would you be willing to do that? Not particularly, no, no. I, I mean, I did costumes the Death Star, some of those black jumpsuits because they had a shortage. And uh, John Muller and I knew each other extremely well. And so he, he put it on to me and said, well, do you want to do this? So I said, yeah, I'll run up a few. Well, at that time, I had my own weapons. But no, that, that doesn't really interest me. I worked on another series called Space Precinct for the Andersons. Hated it. Absolutely hated it. You mentioned how in, I believe, Empire and Return of the Jedi, though it might have been just an Empire, how they had some trouble with the costumes. And so you came in to help some of the costumes, since I, I'm quite sure with the budget they had, they weren't. They didn't have the greatest costuming people. No, well, it wasn't so, much that. It was a simply a question of scheduling. They needed costume. Costumes weren't ready, so they needed some run up in, uh, in England, and that was what I was able to help with. Your, your job was to help them get them done in time to have them ready on set. Yeah, it was a favor, more than anything else, because I have my own workroom. The Imperial costumes, I know they're based off, at least it look, to me, they're, they're, they look like they're based off of, you know, uh, we'll say German Nazi designs as far as uniforms. There you are. Is that is that what the costumes are actually based off of, or do you know anything more about the history of those type of costumes and the armor and stuff than and we do? Because I know you doing costuming, you'd probably know more about that sort of history than I would. Well, the original costumes were made uh, by a company called uh, Angels, and they were made in London. And the fabric, yes, they were based on on um, on Nazi uniforms, and the fabric was produced by a firm. Here in Britain, which still manufactures it, funnily enough, and it's very difficult to track down. All the customers want to get hold of it, but it's only this one firm that makes it. So uh, Angels manufactured all of these suits, which then ended up with um, Lucasfilm. They were all shipped back with sets and God knows what else, all props. What else can I tell you about those particular suits? Not much, to be honest. They were made to measure all of them, except mine. I don't. I know in Star Wars, like the, there's the gray uniforms and there's the black uniforms, you know, for different ranks and so on. Yeah. But like historically, like with Nazis, did they ever have different color uniforms? You know, the gray and black meaning something different, or is that something probably original just for Star Wars? That was just for Star Wars. I mean, there's the obvious illusion of um, the black shirts and Nazi uniforms and SS being black, whereas the rest of the uh, Wehrmacht was in field gray. So there's that illusion, which is. Probably quite intentional. I don't know. You'd have to ask John Morrow about that, but there is definitely that to it. Well, one thing I, n I noticed reading up on A New Hope, you know, which is bef you know before you were involved, is Peter Cushing. You know, had that you know that classic uniform, his classic costume, yeah. and he had these boots, these boots that he Hated. couldn't fit. Hated. They didn't Hated. fit him, and so he had to wear slippers half the time. Well, he preferred um, to wear them. Let's just say he preferred to wear them. <laughs> well, yeah. If I had to wear boots that would hurt my feet or slippers, I'd wear slippers. <laughs> And so uh, by the time they got to Empire, did they actually have boots and stuff that fit, or were they still pretty painful to wear? No, no, they had, they had quite a big selection. Um, I mean, specifically for principal actors, they were all made to measure. The rest of them were all stock uh, riding boots and Second World War stiefel boots that uh, were in stock with Angels. Angels is one of the largest costume houses in the world, still is. 
So they, they have a pretty huge stock of stuff. A, a couple of final questions. The first one being, so you worked with um, and Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back. One of them you worked for an hour, one of them you worked for, for several weeks, and so on. Do you believe that working on those films has has helped you in your career? And if so, how has it helped you or, or changed your career for you? Since they're probably some of the biggest films, at least fan base-wise that you might ever be associated with. The only difference at all, because I, I never confessed to anybody that I'd been, it wasn't until 2009 that somebody phoned me and said, well, in one of these films or two, I said, yes, uh, foolishly, that I was plucked from relative obscurity to come and do the uh, convention circuit, which I, I thoroughly enjoy doing. I mean, I love, love speaking to fans, because in many ways, I'm a nerd about films anyway. So we always end up talking about something completely different, always. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Um, but it's not my be all and end. I don't do the circuit. It just doesn't interest me. It's mechanical, just sitting there, sign, sign, sign. You can't speak to anybody. And if they want to stand, you, you stand up and take a photo. You have somebody standing next to you or sitting next to you saying, you haven't got time for that. Here's another one. This is pretty good. All right. You've got to do it in this pen. Da, 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 da. That's boring. That's just boring. And that's just doing it to make money. I enjoy the fans. I'm doing the convention. But it came to me very, very late, which is why I think my characters still have no names. I mean, I think I'm the only Imperial officer that speaks who hasn't actually got a character name. When I think about it, even the and some of the people who literally are walking across the back of sets, they've all got names, but I haven't got a name. <laughs> I'm still known as the, uh, the Imperial officer uh, executor. That's it. A couple of weeks ago, yeah. it was announced by, that Disney bought Lucasfilm and that to be more Star Wars films. Yeah. You know, most people have a reaction you know, when they found out what was going on and so on. What was your reaction when you found out that Disney bought Lucasfilm and that there'd be more Star Wars films? I was delighted, still am. Um, I'm very impressed by the way Disney handled Marvel. And I think, I think with George Lucas still remaining as either executive producer or as uh, associate producer, whatever happens, that the continuity will carry on. The only problem I have is who they get to write it in the end. Because I did feel, this is a, a value judgment, I did feel that the original trilogy, i.e., three uh, four, four to six are far more superior than the prequels episodes one to three i think a lot was lost with uh, the addition of cgi and the, i think the the scripts were a little bit twee yeah twee is a good word for it so i'm hoping that they're going to try and step back into the darker side and, and give us something with more meat in it well i i know they've announced the episode seven writer mm -hmm. Um, that's uh, Michael Arndt, who got the Academy Award for Little Miss Sunshine, and he wrote Toy Story 3. So at least he's proven he can write stories that lots of people can relate to. And <laughs> so he's a, he's a serious writer. And I know the other day they announced that um, for Episode 8, they're getting um, Kazdan back. Oh, really? Oh, that was Yeah, he's, he's on talks for 8. And then they got the, um, I want to say the X-Men writer for Episode uh, 9. So that should be good for continuity. People love Kazdan. Yeah. And... Uh, Starting off with an Academy Award-winning writer should help a lot. And it'll have a little different feel, of course, but these guys, I don't think they dare mess up Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, there is that problem that you've had. Um, you've had the Clone Wars um, and all that other stuff, the other series, as well as all the expanded universe. I mean, there are so many influences that have been added to it since, since the originals. Um, it's very difficult to know what direction they're going to take these new ones in. They say they're going to follow on from 4, 5, and 6. But who knows? Who knows? Can you imagine trying to write a movie that has to fit in a series where there's been, you know, as you said, TV shows, there's been like 200 books, lots of comics, video games, that has to fit in there and not get the fan, not get, not get fans mad because, you know, some way they're going to ruin a book somewhere and some obscure fan is going to complain. And Can you imagine trying to write in that universe? Tell me about it. I think we did as a definite... Uh, possibility if they're not careful of being like dynasty and bringing oh, somebody boy. back in the shower you know <laughs> okay so uh you know you, you talk about how you love working on the circuit how you love you know you, you, you like talking to, to fans you like interacting with people you, and of course you like doing costumes and all that sort of stuff so and with more star wars coming you know i have a feeling this means you're going to get potentially busier on the circuit and of course have more people buzzing about Star Wars and asking you about Star Wars. So you're excited for, uh, for it, more it's... discussion with fans? Well, I'm not going to be involved in any of these new ones. Uh, but the fandom still is going to talk about the old ones and attach them and there'll be more Star Wars related activities and convention events. Well, I, I hope that uh, with 
with the, the revived profile, as it were, so that uh, drawing in more fans, and I'll, it may pull more people into, into the hobbies, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm looking forward to it that much more, to be honest. Um, I, I don't want to become a career interviewee. <laughs> I, 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 I just go to meet people. I don't really want to sit there answering the same questions year in, year out. I, I know there are people who do that, and they, they make it their, their well, it's their only means of living, to be honest. But I'm still young enough to consider doing something else, and I quite, I quite like to, to be honest. <laughs> and you do do quite a lot of other stuff. You do the costuming, you have, you know, honorary mentions for Academy Awards and so on, and you're going to continue doing that. I'm, at least that's what I'm assuming. You, know, you haven't retired yet, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I sort of semi-retired, but I, I, uh, I paint, so I do all sorts of things. I'm not, and, very, uh, I'm not a very patient sort of person. I need to keep up with me. You sound like one of my relatives who retired and like four months later is like, oh, I'm, I'm too bored, I need to go back to work. Right, right. Sounds like my sort of person. <laughs> okay. By the way, uh, Alex says hi. He says I'm supposed to tell you hi, so does Dave. So. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being on. And uh, Alex is grateful for doing this. And thank you for, you know, for coming on and allowing us to do this. <laughs> ¶¶